Hey, what's going on, y'all? It's your boy, Lil Rail Howery, and I am excited to, uh, to be doing this amazing panel uh, where we're talking about uh, this amazing movie, Judas and the Black Messiah. I'm with uh, Kenny and Keith Lucas, the Lucas brothers, who are two of my good friends. Who really, y'all really, really the brainchild of this. And then my boy, Lakeith Stanfield, looking cool as he can look. Okay, that it's making sense. We need to be doing a cowboy movie after this, so we got to find a true story about some more black cowboys, and then that's what we're gonna do. Okay? There's a lot of black cowboys, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of, but nobody talks about that because you know, but that's a whole other thing. That's not even what this panel was about. It's not about black cowboys, uh, it's about, it's about Judas and the Black Messiah. Lakeith does a brilliant job of playing William O'Neill, uh, where like you know, we already know you're brilliant, Lakeith, in general, as an actor, but like you truly killed it. But I, I want to start with with, with uh, Kenny and Keith first, with you two, man. Like, what made y'all, because look, most people know you guys were doing comedy and stuff like that. I know y'all. We did a sketch series together with, you know, comedy. <laughs> when did y'all start? What, where did all this come from? Where did the ideal you want to do this? Did you start doing the research first? And then I was like, let's do Like, what, how did all this happen? So, I mean, we were... Uh... We were introduced to Hampton's story in college. Uh, we were taking this African American studies course, and uh, it was like a brief sort of uh, moment where we were talking about Hampton. And it always just sort of like got imprinted on our subconscious. We were like, "Man, this is a crazy story, and no one really knows about it." And just like the tragic nature of it all, it kind of like rubbed us the wrong way that it wasn't a more widely known story that it was so obscure. So it sort of stuck with us. Mm -hmm. So once we got into comedy and got into Hollywood a couple of years later, we were like, we want to make this into a movie. Like, how are we so going to make it? So it was right around the time we were, we were filming Friend of the People. It was like 2013, 2014, right, where right. we started to uh, uh, research a little bit more about Hampton. And we read this book, The Assassination of uh, Fred Hampton. Right. And it had a, a, like a brief... Uh, a paragraph or two about William O'Neill. Right. And they just talk about how he was like this like slick, sly character who always dressed fly. And and they didn't really go into detail about his backstory, but that just like caught us by like, like hit, hit, that like was like an entry point. Like this could be like a right, good right. way of like getting into the story of Hampton if we go from his perspective. Right, I mean, right. We found out that there was another Fred Hampton story in the works. And we just presumed that they would go from the perspective of Fred Hampton because that's generally how biopics work. Right. And we wanted to do something that was slightly more inventive on, right. the, on the biopic uh, genre. So we, you know, we, we started doing research on William O'Neill. Right. And then, yeah, we read Eyes on a Prize. We read the transcript of Eyes on a Prize, and William O'Neill just like it just blew our minds that this guy existed and his the conflict that he had to go through and the, the you know just his entire story just felt cinematic to us I mean, mm -hmm. just like this is this is the end this is the story so we put together a treatment mm -hmm. and then we met shaka doing a pilot for fx comedy a, pilot. a comedy pilot for fx and uh and we pitched him our idea and he was like this is brilliant and so we just we shot the shit and we put together a, a, a sort of a beefier outline and then we hooked up with uh, will who had already done a script about fred hampton and then right. we converged and we put it all together. Right. And look, keep. I got to ask you this too, because I, man, man, you, when you uh, was attached to it, we was at like an event, I think we was talking about. I think it was me, you, and Common at the time, right? He was looking at everything. And I think at the time, you may have thought you was going to play Fred first. Like that's who you wanted to play. When did this, when did you find out they wanted you to play William? Was it in the beginning? Um, no, I, uh, well, I, well, when I first got the script, um, for some reason, I just assumed I would be playing Fred. It didn't even cross my mind that I'd be playing anyone else. Um, I was never told I'd be playing Fred, but uh, I, I guess I was just wishful thinking in retrospect. Um, and then, um, you know, when I, when I called Shaka and we talked about the story early on, I, I said, well, yeah, this is really exciting, man. I can't wait to, to play Fred. And I just kept talking and rambling, and he just let me ramble for a while. And he was like, um, actually, I was thinking about you for the role of William O'Neill. And there was just this silence, like this pause. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, and at first I was really kind of against it. Like, you know, no, I can't play this dude. There's no way. I, I, I hate this guy. Right. Um, and that's, that was the case in the beginning of the movie. But as we progressed on, and I, after I actually saw Eyes on the Prize extended, I got an indication that a lot of the you know, exterior bravado that he was bringing in the interview was... Um, was sort of boring and secondary to me 
right. to the, the, the what it was in between the words he was saying, which to me was like, there was a sense of regret and there was a sense of I did something wrong, but let's not talk about that. Anyway, back to the, you know, right. the thing I wanted to pay attention to. That was the thing that I felt felt was more interesting than all that other stuff. So I wanted to, I already went into the character thinking I'm going to take that sliver of insecurity and try and magnify that to, to bring this character to life. I want to really get into what his fears were and, and hopefully making him more relatable to me can make him more relatable to people. But I also didn't want to risk being too relatable and, and too you know, emotionally available, I guess, to, to the audience. And so to, to, to say, I don't know, to like offset the fact that he did some really think like messed up things. I, so, so I tried to find the balance with Shaka and it was hard. And, and a lot of times I wouldn't know if I was going too far or not far enough, or should I make it make, maybe make him a little bit more crazy in this moment. And, um, and Shaka would help me fine tune all those things to, 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 to find a balance. In it. And that was one of the harder parts. And also I had internal conflict the whole time with everything that the character was doing, I was conflicted about it. So I guess you kind of can see that working in the character as well. You can see that, like, I hate doing this. Like, I hate being here. When I was in the apartment having to poison Fred, I was literally like sick that day. Like, I couldn't stop compulsively crying. <laughs> and shock is like, we don't need that in this moment. But uh, so I had to alert, like work it all out and then, you know, try to position myself in the right place in the right frame of mind. But it was so real. Daniel to me was Fred. And we were sat back into that house in those clothes. I felt I was O'Neill and I had to do this. And um, yeah, it was intense. One of the what, most intense things I've ever done. What, what, and it's crazy. I remember being on set with you and you know, it's crazy because I know you, right? And I know how you are, you are getting engulfed in some things. And I could see you being, you know, kind of in this you know, it's funny. I describe it like get out in a way with you, right? Where you're, you know, when you think about uh, when and you played a character that was stuck in a sunken place, right? Yeah. And I felt like, like sometimes just watching you just chill on set, it was almost a battle of, man, I don't, you know, I don't fuck with this dude like that, but I have to perform it in such a way. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, it was a, I, I literally saw you battling with yourself. It was like kind of yeah. crazy. And I think like an extra tried to come speak to you. And I was like, no, he good. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, and that, that was really happening. <laughs> By the way, I got to say, also, I was really impressed uh, with you, Ray, and you made a, a, a very nice sparring partner because, because you're such a nice guy. And it's like, you know, we always have a good relationship. And then all of a sudden it's like, that little joke, put it in his drink. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, you know, a part of me was really feeling betrayed, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I think that was important to color the scene. So, yeah, that was just, it was just, it was just one intense moment after another. Right. And having to juggle that. So it was unique. And, and I didn't know that about you guys um, in the origin story of uh, building um, yeah. the story to be made. That's, that's, yeah. that's and you know, what's, what's funny is that when we were thinking about the story, we were like, we want we need Lakeith to play William O'Neill. We were like, well, you're the only actor that right. really thought we trusted with that that role. Like because it's such a complex character. I mean, it's probably one of the most complex characters that I mean I've ever seen on the screen. Right. And uh yeah, you, you have a you have a gift, man, just to, to nail those 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 that, that complexity, because right. the nuance to it that I, I think when you watch the movie multiple times, you're like, holy shit, this character is like He's clearly battling with something every scene right, right, from the beginning right, and, and to the end. Right. And it's like, you know, you nailed it, man. Yeah, we were thinking like uh, De Niro and Taxi Driver, that sort of like the the, the existentialism, the isolation, uh, the, the feeling like you're adrift. Like you you just capture all that with your face and your emotion and your your the way you speak. Like it, it was a flawless performance. Flawless. Oh, thank you. And, but you know that, and that's the thing about, and this is why I like where the story didn't go all the way so far back, and where where it took it from, you know, because I think the brilliance of this movie is it's really described in Fred Hampton, you know, in a way, because I'm once again I'm from the west side of Chicago, so like I've always heard about Fred. Matter of fact, it felt like it was only our black history at one time, like right. no nobody else knew about this brother, but just if he was on the west side of Chicago. You know, <laughs> like, that's, probably, that's probably some truth to that, man. 
but which I think this is why this works because it's not a bunch. It, I mean, it's information out there, but it's not like it's not it's not oversaturated, right? You know, right. Like, you tell you hear Dr. King's story. It's about you got little boy King that came out like it's so many right. versions of different things. But I, right. I, but, I, but but what, but I would have to say about this is this is what I want to ask you guys about this too is. I like the fact, I think you guys, and, and this was shocking too, I guess, writing it. When you guys were writing it, did you understand truly what Fred's um, intentions was, right? Because most of the time when you hear about Black Panthers, it's only one-sided, like they only right. did this and this and that. And that's why the FBI wanted to take them out because they were terrorists and that's what they were mm-hmm. trying to say to get Whitey. But that wasn't what Fred Hampton was about, right? He was about bringing people together, right? Right. I mean, you know, again, a, a lot of the things that I knew about Fred was very surface level. I knew a lot about his death. I, I mean, as, as we started doing research, you, you learn about the assassination and the tragedy of that, but you don't really know about like the work that he did in the community. The organizing. Yeah. The organizing, the, the you know, you know the, the free breakfast program. I didn't know that the free breakfast program started in Chicago and then expanded yeah. uh, throughout the country. Like right. we had a free breakfast program in Newark. And I remember vividly. I didn't know that it was it was it originated in Chicago. So right. it's like a lot of a lot of things like that you don't learn about. Uh, you certainly don't learn about you know O'Neill, but you like it's like it's so under under wraps. And in doing research for this project and in writing and writing the story, it's like uh, it was revelatory in, t- in terms of just understanding the importance of the uh, Illinois chapter of uh, the Black Panthers. Right. Because a lot of times you only learn about the Oakland chapter. Right, they're like the the they're they're the face of the Black Panthers, not not so much the the Illinois chapter, but I feel like the Illinois chapter just like they did a lot of like brilliant things on on the on policy that has uh, had a huge impact right. on the country. Right. Well, let me ask both all three of this actually, um, because you have some people, and I've seen a couple things online where like you hear people like, why would they do a story about the rat? Why why does the rat? Get the story. He's the back. Why does he? Which it, it annoys me because I'm like, well, it's you know, you do have to understand that you know, black people are so weird. And I love us, right? But it's almost <laughs> like it's just it's always just this one right. one lens of how you should do things on how you should see things. And I think that's why this movie's brilliant. But what do you have to say to that? Like when people say that, like when they're like, oh, this is why would they do the story about the rap? But like it's it's deeper than that, right? Yeah, I mean, I think. I think William O'Neill is as not as much a victim of, as Fred, but I think he's also a, a victim of circumstances. I mean, he was a young black dude uh, caught up in crime. He gets pulled over, and then the FBI lays on lays this sort of proposition on him. It's a very Faustian bargain. It's like if I do this, I, I avoid jail time. Like I, I think any young brother can understand that. But but more importantly, like this is a story about the the forces of COINTELPRO Pro and the impact of systemic racism on, on two young brothers at a particular time. In order to tell that story in, in a more nuanced way, I think you, you have to get Will's perspective. I mean, you, if, you, if you leave him out, then I think you're getting a one-sided perspective and it's not nuanced or rich enough, in my right, opinion. Right, and also it's like, as Kenny alluded to, it's like, you know, I, I know a lot of brothers who when they watch this movie, they're probably gonna see themselves more like Will than like Fred. Fred is a very unique kind of person. You know what I mean? He's like, you don't meet a lot of Fred Hamptons. You don't meet a lot of people who are willing to die for their beliefs. But you do meet people who make pragmatic choices all the time. I I make pragmatic choices. He makes pragmatic. I I, I certainly saw myself more in Will than in Fred. I can can admit that. I mean, that's why the story, I was attracted to the story. Because it's like, I feel like the story of the, the William O'Neills of the world, they're not told because of that fear. And I'm like, sometimes when you're an artist, you have to not think about the fear and just like go head, head strong into something that that you that probably never would have been done before. It, and it has never been done before. But right. now that it has been done, I think that we were able to tell a richer story. Right. Yeah, and I also think oftentimes when it comes to cinema, um, audiences can be distrusting. Um, mm. the, heroes and the way that they're depicted, especially things that are historically um, had, had actually happened. And so people assume that Hollywood would take these stories and generalization using Hollywood as you know, the machine, which to some extent is understandable that they will take these characters and, 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 and rape them of their richness and, and, and their 
truth and authenticity. And also, it means a lot to us as Black Americans to be represented in cinema still, because it's been so young and we're very protective of that. We're like, no, you're not going to represent us this way. We're tired of being rep misrepresented, which I understand. And so when people have grievances about um, using O'Neill as a, as a, um, the, as a sort of, um, um, I guess, the catalyst or the train to bring you the audiences into the story, I understand why people might be, um, you know, taken aback by that. I would say, though, we have to give ourselves as uh, Black cinema makers and people in Hollywood, uh, um, as audiences watching them, have to give ourselves a chance to tell stories. We have to see perspectives that we might be uncomfortable with. This is the only way we expand and are able to tell stories from different viewpoints. We cannot be, we can't exist in a sort of a canon of how we do things. That makes things boring. That makes them lazy. That makes them not actually um, um, enjoyable to ingest. We got to be used to doing, get more used to doing uncomfortable things. And you'll find, and I think people will find with this movie, that fruits can come out of that. You have your decisions to make about how you feel about the characters. No one's going to try and pull your strings one way or the other, but you have to go on the experience and arrive from a perspective that's unique to have a unique, um, you know, just a perspective of it. I mean, also, um, I feel like coming from um, O'Neill's perspective, I agree with what you guys are saying. There are much more people who are like William O'Neill than who are oh, yeah. like Hampton. And so if you can relate to that and see yourself and what you consider to be the snitch, the rat, the bitch, or whatever you want to call them, then you might be able to, you know, have it, you know, there might be something good that comes out of that self-reflection of having to sit in the mirror to some extent with this character. And as he travels through these sticky situations, ask yourself, what decision would you have made? Right, right, right. That, that's important, you know. Right, right. I mean, that's the challenge, right? That's the that's the challenge. You want to challenge the audience. You don't want to spoon feed them. You want right. you want them to to ask very very difficult questions. Right. I know when I was when we were thinking about the William O'Neill character, it's like, man, he he's a difficult character. Yeah. He's like he's just he's so hard to understand, and it's like I feel like people are very complex, and like, and I feel like when they see Will, they their instinct is going to be this guy but then i think yeah. as they think about it more and reflect more on it, they're going to be like well, what, what would i have done right, right, right. in that situation right. Right. you see the stark contrast as to what this guy was putting on versus what he might have been feeling and going through internally and so it it puts you in the place you're like damn oh well, shit right. and that's very american right that this yeah. bravado but internally we're all crumbling inside right, right, right. Right. So, you know, well, Lakeith, that's your brilliance too, bro. Like, and it's funny you bring up that 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 particular eyes on the fries uh, footage, right? Because you, if you watch the interview, it looks like he is trying to convince himself, right, right. <laughs> of what he did. And like, you did that in so many ways, man. Like, you know, I, which I I think is interesting about how great of an actor you are. Mm -hmm. Is we can just look at your face and right. just whatever this battle O'Neill is having, right? Even like, I think it's, and it's not, I mean, look, people watch the movie, but it's a scene where like, you know, you talk shit about, you know, you know, I think they had just fucked up the office and you just like, you just going in and shit like, yeah, motherfucker, motherfucker. And you get in the car, you still talking shit, motherfucker. Yeah. You know, like, and it's like, <laughs> just to watch O'Neill, cause he's acting all this out. Right. And he has to almost calm down. That's when he starts laughing, when you start laughing like <laughs> 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 you know, it's just a, it's just fascinating watching this guy, you know, because he's being taken advantage of, like y'all said, like, you know, we see it all the time. Like, you know, when you do, uh, once again, you watch the Eyes on the Prize interview, and once again, you, you did this in a movie by showing this, like, he thought that man was his mentor at one time. Right, 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 right. He thought right. the fucking FBI agent was mentoring him. Right. Because he let him come in his house. Right. And it's, the, it's this acceptance thing, too. That's why, like, when you do watch this movie, and it's interesting you say that, it's so many different versions why I think a lot of people will relate to William. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, right. I just kind of fit in with some with some bullshit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, where, like, you know, it's it's a lot. It's so many layers to it. Yeah. And I think you did an amazing job, and I think it's courageous right. that William O'Neill is the train that drives us into this story. Right. You know, and I think it doesn't take away at all from, you know, from Fred Hampton's legacy, which is why, you know, the family, you know, Fred Hampton, Chairman Fred Hampton Jr., you know, was on board, on set. I used right. to laugh at how, like, Fred Hampton Jr. would look at Lakeith sometimes, like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, he wanted to steal all the but it was <laughs> there was some definite times where I look, I'm like, damn, you want to fight me? 
<laughs> I'm like, I understand. I totally get it. Like, especially up in the garden. Like, I remember when I first met him when we were in the trailer. I was in the trailer doing uh, hair and makeup, and he just come to the trailer. Just you know, he's greeting people. You know, I think Daniel was next to me, and I think Dominique was on the other side. He came up, he greeted Daniel, he greeted Dominique, and then he left. And uh, then he came back to the trailer and then introduced himself to me. He's probably needed a second or something. Like, uh, yeah, but, you know, the first thing he said, he's like, you ain't got no wise on you, dude. You ain't got nothing. You know, it must be, I can't understand how yeah. weird that must be to see the person that, right. or, or like a reimagination of the person that, right. you know, right. would get to your father being killed before you even fucking born. I mean, that must be insane. And right. the Black Panther Party Cubs, who were on set the whole time, I'm sure we're just like seeing a lot of people who we were depicting and being like, I wish <laughs> you know, I could just strangle you, you know. We like, hey man, I was acting shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey man, hey, look, man, you say sorry to Bobby, right? Hey. <laughs> I start playing the movie on my phone. Look, look, look. <laughs> yeah, that's a testament to, you know, the, the hair and makeup and wardrobe. How right, right, right. the word to you know really getting the specifics down, and I mean I hope you know and I and I, and I hope that everyone that's involved with this can see that we we tried to pay really close attention to detail and be as authentic as authentic as we could, and this wasn't for us about a winner or a loser or who was right and who was wrong. It's really mm -hmm. for me isn't even a story that is really primarily about the betrayal. Really, it's much bigger than that. This is metal. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. In a lot of ways, and I think I'm that's. Sorry, I'm seeing like stuff on Twitter where people are like, they're like reflecting deeply on the film. Like it's not just like, oh, that was a good one. It's like, I can't get this movie out of my mind, and, and that's what you want. You want people like to leave the film and just be like, what yeah. The so fuck so many of my watch? friends are like, man, I I watched it and then I slept and then I woke up and I thought about it again. And I think that's a testament to the performances. It's a testament to the direction and 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 the cinematography. All of it was just like sublime. Uh, and you I know what's crazy? I fell into that rabbit hole too. Like even being in it and watching it over and over again as I have. Like you know, one of the biggest things you know that I that I think is important and just for me in general, you know, Fred Hampton was 21 years old. Right? I know. Yeah. And, you know, that's so young. Mm -hmm. That's that's so young. And when I first started hearing about Fred Hampton, I was a kid, and you know, 21 ain't young yet until you surpass it. You right. Know, right. 21 years old now. And one of the biggest things, and I hope people get, get out of this with this movie on how we need to make sure as adults, as the OGs, as the, the older people in situations to support these young voices who, who are looking to make real change like that. It is actually up to us to protect them and invest into them. Right, right, right. You know, that brother kind of was, he's 20, he was doing that on his own in a way. Right. Right? His group of friends, basically. Right, like, right. Most of it, they were all young people. So like I, you know, I just hope, you know, when people from, you know, my generation on up recognize we do have young voices like this. And this is why we extremely need to support and and man, uplift them. Right. That should have been protected. They assassinated a 21 year old young right. man. Right. Oh, that's another thing I, I really hope and when I'm and I'm so glad that this film touches on is the way in which the government was involved. And oh. not only involved, but actively pushing oh, yeah. for this, these assassins. Yes. Like, oh, he's going to jail? Fuck that. I need something else. And I think yeah. people need to pay attention to that. When they're thinking about their governments and, and, and who they put their trust in, mm -hmm. and voting and elections and all of these different things, you got to consider the corruption that is at the yeah. very root of these things. And like, you really got to ho hold these people accountable because they own the same shit now. If somebody oh, yeah. come up and they're trying to be some kind of figurehead and lead things and change things, best believe they own his ass. You know what I mean? And <laughs> and it's it, and a lot of the problem is we just stand by and let like, you know, these really great figures, you know, I'm not saying that that's what happens all the time, but I'm just saying, you know, we sit, we sit idle sometimes and we don't hold the government accountable. Fuck right. uh, Judas, like the real problem is it starts, right. it starts with the sword. Right. You know, gotta really look at that. I mean, I, they, somebody asked me earlier in the interview, you know, do you, do you see that, you know, justice is happening on a more consistent basis in the courtroom as it applies to black people? I'm like, look, all the years I've been black and all the years I've known the justice system and how it relates to us, and not just generally, but especially black people, mm -hmm. ain't no justice there. No. That shit is corrupt from the top to the bottom. You know what I mean? So we gotta, we gotta just, and I hope that that helps people start to realize that. And like, maybe, you know, what do we do? 
we still we're figuring out how we move forward and how we but we know what we're not going to do though you know what right. I'm saying? We know what we don't um you know trust in them so you know i think it's a good opportunity for people too to hold their governments accountable oh that yeah they was doing at the time was terrible and people right. that, 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 that's, that's my hero I hope everybody listened to these speeches in this movie. I mean, like it, it's just little small tidbits. Like even when you know Daniel and one of the things he talk, he just talk about taxes and we pay tax. Like we basically, and I told somebody this, I pay a lot in taxes, y'all. I pay yeah. a lot. I've been doing okay. Now I have to pay all this. And I'm like, wait a minute, sweat. Let me get this. Straight. I'm paying all this money, and the police still may whoop my ass. Right. I'm, right. I'm paying them to whoop my ass. Yeah. Fuck me up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, I know I hate that shit every time I come out to you. God damn, bitch. <laughs> I'm doing that just so you could, you know, especially, you know, we live, you know, when you, you know, I've been fortunate enough to live in a nice a neighborhood and drive a nice car. And so they, they'll, they'll look at your ass. Like, you know, you're in Beverly Hills and you're driving in a nice car and you're young and black. They're looking at you like, what the fuck? I've been pulled over right. several times. And right. just like, you know, what you on? I'm just checking up. You know what I mean? I'm like, yo. I can't drive around this place and I just spent all the like I, I, I paid for your uniform and your gun. <laughs> you're about to use it on me. Like, that's true. It's annoying. But you know, things gotta change, man. And I do think films like this help with that conversation and push it forward and help us. We we forcing you to have to look at this story of Fred Anthony. Look at the shit you did, America. You know what I mean? All right, all right. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of people don't know about COINTELPRO. They don't know that the government was actively involved in assassinating uh uh, Americans who exercise their constitutional right. Like they don't know shit because yeah. of, co- of course our education system doesn't provide that sort of information. So it's like, I feel like this movie will provide a lot of people with that first, uh, the first time actually seeing what the government did. And like, I think what, five days ago, like there were, there were new documents released mm-hmm. that, that proved that uh, Hoover and William Sullivan are the people that were higher up in the FBI were actively involved in assassinating Fred. That, and that, that they knew William O'Neill. Right. William O'Neill met with William Sullivan and I think he met with Hoover. Like they knew this guy. Like, mm-hmm. and I'm like, what? Like that's, that was so crazy to me. And like, I was like, at that point I was like, I'm convinced the FBI killed him. Okay. Like I'm, I'm a hundred percent convinced. I mean, I, we all think it, but I think, I think it's a hundred percent. Right. So it was like, we're, we're just getting this information out about the FBI. So I think our movie is coming out right in time to, to, to further illuminate what the, what the federal government did to us and what they continue to do to us. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, man, this conversation was uh, was extremely dope. You know, I, I love you guys. We, I can love you too, bro. Talk. We, this, this could be a weekly podcast. <laughs> 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 so, what's going on? So, because and, and look, I want people to truly watch and enjoy this film. The Lucas Brothers, bro, I applaud y'all. Like I, I, because I, you know, we, you know, it's so many people mentioned us really involved with this film but like right. man bro it, y- y'all the brainchild of this so just man, to a, out it's my it's friends a, i'm like proud of y'all i love yeah. y'all y'all geniuses to me and you know it's so it's so it's so dope i mean i'll say all this in a group text in a minute right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this, this is a team effort and i mean a lot of a lot of it i mean lakeith you 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 did your thing, man. Like I mean, without without that performance, I don't think this film like works. Like I just feel right. like that was just one of the things that just blew me away. The, the right, whole, right, right, right. Yeah. So this is full cool circle for me too with Lakeith and Daniel. You know that 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 Get Out connection. Get out there, connection right, right. It's, it's beautiful. It's an underrated connection, man. Like you know, like I I am. I'm like I'm happy I could text y'all sometimes right. Lakeith, because I'm like I think you guys are brilliant. And you know, just to be around guys like you guys, and it's and you know, our friendship has grown over the years since you know since we did get out. I'm just proud of you too, brother. You you becoming a you're becoming a staple in Hollywood, not only just in front of the camera, but be uh, you know behind the camera. You know what I'm saying? Outside the 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 Hollywood, and that you're a real one. You don't mind being truthful, and that is what this game needs. You know what I'm saying? And this movie to me comes out at a perfect time where. You know, I'm ready to see who all, you know, because we was in quarantine, everybody was talking all that good stuff. Like, we all going to step up. We're going to make sure to make changes in Hollywood and do this and tell more of our stories. Well, here we go. This movie challenges that. Right, right, right. If that's what everybody on. Let's see it. Right, right, right. Right, right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Love right, it. Uh, I appreciate oh, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Lakeith. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, right before we go, sorry to interrupt. I just want to say 
to Lucas Brothers, I really appreciate you guys even, you know, planting the seed for this to be. I'm so happy this movie's here. I always wanted to work on things like this. I mean, I I mean, I got the, the fist tattooed on my chest when I was like 16, 17, you know, so I always have loved the Panthers and what they represented. And this is a dream come true, truly. And um, I just really, really appreciate you guys for it for even thinking to bring it to the forefront and fighting the fight. I know this wasn't easy and I know it wasn't an easy road to walk, but you continued and you believe and that means the fucking world. And uh, we all fighting a good fight together and I never had a better group of people to work with on a set. And so I just really appreciate y'all for even planning a seat to create that environment for us. And right. uh, yeah, and you know, me and Rail, you know, we're gonna do more shit together anyway. <laughs> Hi, y'all, I appreciate y'all. Thanks for tuning in and uh yeah go see judas and the black messiah february 12th in theaters and on hbo max peace Thank out you. love y'all man peace, peace.